Now, the format tonight is quite straightforward. Uh, we will have a panel discussion tonight, and there's room for Q&A, and we finish at 8 o'clock. Um, well, it might be Jaron here, but it's election day in Indonesia, another vibrant democracy next door. Um, and tonight, I'm pleased to welcome three speakers. And the way we'll do it is I'll introduce them now. They'll all come up one by one. They'll all come up here one by one to give their address, which will last for about 10 minutes. And then we can have Q&A as a panel. Now, first, I'd like to introduce Phil Turtle. Phil is the national president of the Australia-Indonesia Business Council. He's an engineer. Uh, he's a senior consultant to AsiaLink Business and he helps Aussies do business across Asia. And he's a great friend of the Institute and uh, a passionate advocate for Australia and the region, now, called, now also known as the Indo-Pacific. So, Phil, would you like to come up? In fact, I'll sit you there and then I'll move you here, but I'll introduce, I'll introduce Associate Professor Hadrian Jaja de Kerta, um, who is, is from the School of Business and Law at Edith Cowan University, where he lectures in accounting. He's also an engineer, uh, so he's an engineer and a chartered accountant. Uh, he's got a, a deep academic history, which includes the University of Lincoln. Um, he's a management with strong links in the region and beyond, including the United States. He's vice president of the Indonesia Institute. He's a founding member and vice president of the ASEAN Chamber of Commerce. And he's also the father of um, one of the great one of one of our awardees, a Peter Sim awardee from about three years ago. Uh, and I'm pleased to hear that your son is now in Cambridge. So I welcome you and welcome your wife as well. And our third speaker is Ella Prihatini. She's a teaching fellow at the UWA School of Social Sciences. Uh, she's a graduate uh, in international relations from Gajah Mada University in Yogyakarta. Uh, she's got a Master of Development Practice from the University of Queensland. Uh, her research areas include gender and electoral politics, the use of social media in Indonesia. So quite a fascinating um, depth of interest at the moment. Uh, she's a regular participant in media here in Australia, including uh, The Conversation and SBS Radio. Um, she's affiliated with the UWA Centre for Muslim States and Societies and was recently awarded the Khalifa al Falasi Prize in Muslim Studies. In fact, you're the awardee this year, so congratulations. So please come and join us, Ella. So as I said, the, the way we'll do this is perhaps I could ask... Um, I'll, I'll join you down there. Perhaps I could ask Phil to come up and um, give your address, Phil. Thanks. Well, thanks, John. Thanks, everyone. Um, John's very impressive Bahasa Indonesia skills at the outset remind me that John was also stationed at the embassy in Jakarta some years ago with Jennifer. And, of course, Jennifer, you've come full circle being back there now representing our fine state there. So thanks very much, John, as state president of the AIA. As you say, a, a passionate supporter of your organisation. My dear friend Amy, I believe, is on your committee, is not here with, me, with us tonight, who invited me. She's off snorkelling in Indonesia as we speak, so I hope she's enjoying that. Um, obviously, acknowledge my, my colleague and friend Ross Taylor, uh, head of the Indonesia Institute, who's also responsible for me having the job that I've got now with the, the Business Council some 10 years or so later. Um, Jennifer, obviously. Uh, Ambassador Sue Boyd, thanks. Uh, great to see you again, Sue. Um, also, my cheer squad, Mandy Lowden, who's my very special guest here tonight. Mandy, thanks for coming along tonight. And obviously, my fellow presenters, Hadrian and Ella. I guess um, tonight's topic, if my presentation is, is fired up, well, the topic obviously covers the very important election today, but I get the easy topic of more the, the business relationship and the economic or the trade uh, agreement, which many of you know might, uh, might know has been recently signed in Jakarta, just in a bit of a holding pattern at the moment while, while both countries go through their elections and we can get this uh, agreement inked and into practice. So uh, just very quickly, I'll, I'll flick through just a bit about our organisation. We are a truly national organisation in every state and territory, 450-odd members, in all sorts of different sectors. You know, every sort of business you can imagine they're involved with our organisation. We also have a sister organisation in Indonesia in five cities, so again, we've got fantastic reach. 
Um, we do a lot of networking events, advocacy, information sharing. We're also very passionate about our younger members coming through, as I know your own organisation is, John, with your Young Professionals Network. Again, it's a very important today in Indonesia's election. I guess it's the engineer in me also that thinks about the logistics of 192 or 193 million people all going to the poll on one day with five separate uh, elections. Um, so just a couple of snaps of recent rallies of the two contenders. I know my colleagues are going to talk more about it. Uh, and just a quick shot of the indelible ink which is used to record people who, who voted. Um, in terms of the oh, what's known as the Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, very uh, you know, comprehensive agreements are seen to be the flavour. You know, you see a lot of countries around the world signing comprehensive partnerships rather than traditional FTAs. But from the outset, and this process I've been involved in for more than a decade now, is right from the outset meant to be more of a partnership between our, our great neighbour in, with Indonesia rather than just a transactional um, trading relationship. Certainly focusing on opportunities for Indonesian and Australian businesses to co-invest. You know, you look at uh, the cattle industry, for instance, which is w one of WA's biggest one. You know, certainly great opportunities for Australian investors to invest in, in feedlots and other uh, industries in Indonesia, and also for Indonesian investors in our own cattle stations. And also a focus on what's known as non-tariff measures. So it's not just about reducing tariffs on the goods flowing in both directions, but just a number of deliberate initiatives to make business easier between the two. And I know Ross Taylor will comment on the visa issues later and ask me some tricky questions. But certainly the movement of people, movement of students is a very important um, aspect. And also reduction, you know, easing of investment rules and, and the like. So not just down to how much duty you're paying on your goods. Um, Again, just looking at a few reasons why the agreement matters. You know, many of you know, would know many of the stats about Indonesia, but already, you know, the fourth, fourth, mo fourth most populous nation in the world, an economy that is pretty much on par with our own, but of course that trillion dollar economy is distributed amongst 270 million people rather than now 24 million. Uh, but with its current growth trajectory, the uh, GDP growth of about 5% year on year, still tracking to be a top 10 economy, you know, so it'll be a G20 country as we're drifting drifting out, a very technologically advanced country, um, young and entrepreneurial, and, and obviously very strategically important for Australia for all sorts of defence uh, reasons. You would know that there's very strong collaboration between our defence and security forces, but you recognise how important our trade routes, our iron ore and our coal and everything that goes to China, all of that sails through the Straits of Indonesia. So if we don't have a good relationship with Indonesia, um, we could have a big problem. Um, and of course, Indonesia, I, I say looking north. You know, Indonesia is not waiting for Australia to keep up. You know, it's looking to China, Japan, Korea and the like. So we've really got to stake our um, territory with our friend and generally an underdone relationship. Um, so the, the trade, the value of the trade between the countries is, is crazy low compared to what it might be with Thailand or with New Zealand even. And, and just across the bottom for illustration, I, I've got four logos there, Gojak, Buka Lapak, Tokopedia and Traveloka. Those four businesses are start-up businesses in Indonesia, all, all categorised as unicorns. They're all $1 billion US capital businesses and Gojek in the last week, I think, has become what they call a Decacorn, which is a $10 billion company. So Indonesia is, is not a backward country, believe me. Um, and these are probably all manned by very smart, smart young people. Um, again, just in terms of the backdrop of existing agreements, this uh, SEPA builds upon the Australia, oh, the ASEAN Australia Free New Zealand Free Trade Agreement, which came in in 2010, but Indonesia uh, joined in 2012. Um, and just very quickly in the history, you know, this SEPA has its origins back in a joint feasibility study back in 2007, then what's known as the Business Partnership Group, which includes us, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the Australian Industry Group, Cardin, which is the in, uh, Indonesian in ver uh, version of the Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and Apindo, the Indonesian Employers Association. We all got together, um, had a number of workshops, and we advised government at a couple of points through the process as to what business felt was uh, important to have in this agreement. And as far as free trade agreements go for Australia, this is a unique situation. There's been no other trade agreement where we've had that same level of business engagement as this one. Um, so the first position paper in the middle there was one we lodged in 2013 and another one in 2016. And of course, in between those stages, we had unfortunate incidents like Australia being caught spying on the Indonesian president, which kind of put a 
a hold on things for a while. And then also, uh, unfortunately, a couple of Australians being executed uh, for drug-related crime in Bali also put a hold on things for a, for a little while. Um, so again, uh, five days into our current Prime Minister's uh, reign as Prime Minister, he was on a flight to Jakarta to um, meet with the President and also announce that negotiations had concluded, that our trade negotiators were happy with how the agreement looked. Um, and then... Unfortunate, oh, an unfortunate, oh sorry, I'll just go back one, but at the same time there was also announced not only the trade agreement but also what's called the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership, so that had a number of pillars, pillar one very fortunately was the business relationship, so uh, the economic and development partnership, but there's also other pillars of connecting people through education, uh, regional security, maritime cooperation, obviously the ocean between us is our shared backyard, we've got to look after that. And obviously, as John mentioned, the Indo-Pacific region, you know, collectively you know, looking after the health of our, our region. Um, and then another unexpected delay. Uh, our Prime Minister decided he wanted to move um, our embassy in, in um, Jerusalem. And of course, Indonesia being a very large Muslim country was, uh, and, and big supporters of Palestine were not too happy about that. So once again, there was a, an unfortunate delay. But you know, a few months later in March, March the 4th, uh, I was fortunate to be with our current Trade Minister Simon Birmingham but the former Trade Minister Steve Chobo in Jakarta for the, the signing of the agreement, so a very important day and you can imagine uh, for myself and Ross having had such uh, a long history with it, it was a, a great day for us. Um, again, one, one of the things in doing business with Indonesia, people are always asking about corruption and that's certainly something which Indonesia has been doing a lot to address. Uh, this chart very quickly tracks Indonesia's progress from being probably one of the very worst countries in the world for corruption, but over a relatively short period of time with some deliberate work and also the um, creation of the KPK, which is the Crime, uh, sorry, Corruption Eradication Commission, there's been some very steady uh, improvement um, and with Indonesia being much more middle of the pack these days. Um, but also in terms of ease of doing business, you know, Indonesia also recognised that it wasn't the easiest place in the world to do business. So again, there's been some very deliberate initiatives to improve that ranking. And you can see how over the years there's been a steady improvement, um, a little bit of a, you know, a stall in, in the last year or so. But I think that's just been the government's been, you know, apart from the fact they've been quite successful, they've been very focused on other, on other things. Um, key outcomes, a again, I'm not going to go into these in, in much detail, but certainly for the export of Australian goods into Indonesia, um, you know, pretty much 99% of those will go in duty-free now. Um, again, a slight improvement on what Ansfordor was. Uh, and in, uh, there'll be a lot of relaxation on the issuance of import uh, quotas and, uh, and the like, which makes in export of material or goods much easier. Um, Again, I've just got a list now. These lists I've just cut and paste straight from DFAT's website, which goes into these in much detail, but I've really only used these for illustration. So whether it's in cattle uh, or in grains and sugar, um, dairy, citrus, vegetables, um, steel products, just as an example, and steel products, you know, one of our close members, you know, I know we're in Chatham House Rules here, Blue Scope Steel, for instance, a very big operation in Indonesia. That one change for them alone makes $20 million a year, bottom line difference for them. So you know, the prize is certainly worth, uh, worth chasing. Um, and of course, some other uh, you know, improvements in trade facilitation, again, in non-tariff measures. Um, and again, unique. No other free trade agreement that Australia has signed is there a separate chapter on non-tariff measures. Um, and again, just in, that was in the goods sector I showed before, but in services, a lot of focus on education. You know, Indonesia has a great need for uh, skilling its workforce to continue its development. So uh, relaxation in rules for Australian universities and TVET providers to own bricks and mortar facilities in Indonesia. So big opportunities there. Um, mining and METs, you know, big opportunity for West Australia. Hospitals, you know, healthcare has opened up, aged care. So there's going to be, you'll see a lot of uh, further Australian investment, telecommunications. You know, I was last week or the week before, I was with Telstra in Indonesia. We've got a very impressive um, footprint in Indonesia already, and this will, this will help them expand. And again, tourism, professional services, construction, construction services, energy, wastewater, transport, 
and the like. But I guess coming back, you know, from the very start of this agreement, it was recognised that it needed to be a balanced agreement. It couldn't just be an Australia wins, Indonesia loses agreement. That was not going to fly. So very deliberately all the way through, there's been a deliberate conversation to say, OK, um, what can we give up so that you can give us something back in return? So there's been a number of initiatives. Um, where Australia has 99% of its goods going out tariff-free, Indonesia gets 100%. So all Indonesian goods uh, coming into Australia will be duty-free. And there's a, a fair degree of excitement about Indonesia's uh, automotive industry. You'd all know that Australia has shut down its own indigenous automotive industry. Yeah, Indonesia still manufactures a lot of cars for the, U, uh, for the region. Um, it makes electric vehicles, and there's a real focus on to see how uh, Indonesian-made uh, electric vehicles might find their way onto Australian roads. Um, and again, a number of I benefits for Indonesia. Uh, a lot of you know, Indonesian investments will still have to go through the foreign investment review process, which any do, um, but a lot around skills exchange, you know, terrific photographs of young Indonesians who come out and work on cattle stations or have terrific other experiences here um, in Australia. And again, I know Ross will comment on this later, but an increase in the number of work and holiday visas up from 1,000 to, to 4,000. Um, but how many are actually delivered on is yet to, be, yet to be seen. And I guess really just the way ahead now, we have a, a signed agreement, but there is a process of ratification that needs to go through in both parliaments, whatever those parliaments might look like after today and after May the 18th. Um, and... Uh, there's a within Australia. There's certainly the Joint Standing Committee for Treaties, which uh, a parliamentary committee, which the agreement has to go through to be then presented to, to Parliament for signing. Um, also, if we happen to end up with a Labor government after May the 18th, uh, Labor's on the record of not liking uh, certain provisions in the agreement as it is. There's an agreement for inter investor state dispute. Um, Solution. I can't remember what that off the top of my head the other S stands for, but it really just gives businesses and investors the right to sue uh, sovereign governments if they're not happy about how their investment's treated. And Australia, for instance, uh, was on the end of a lawsuit regarding our tobacco plain packaging uh, a few years ago. We ended up winning, but the government had to spend a lot of time and, and spend you know, tens of millions of dollars defending that. So Labor not too keen on, on going through that again. Um, I then adapt the Indonesian uh, expression of socialisation, which I use a lot in my own vocabulary these days, but really just the process where we get out there and talk about the agreement and events like tonight, thanks again, John, for inviting me, for us to get out and, and tell more people about it, get them excited about it and understand it. Also, I'm not looking for my signs. Stop, we're ready. OK, well, it's my last slide, so that's perfect. Um, and, and activation, because, again, with these agreements, um, you can't just sit on your bum, excuse the uh, French, You've got to go out there, research them and do things deliberately different to make sure you, your documentation, etc., is, is suitable. So um, with that, perfect timing. Thank you very much, everyone. Well, thanks, Phil. For those of you who can't see, Molly, our secretary, is here with uh, signs holding them up, which <laughs> got to look over there. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Two-minute two minute warning. So I'll watch that too because you'll say stop to me too. But thanks, Phil. That was terrific. Jogged through that so well. And that's why you're president of the Australian Indonesia Business Council. Well done. Thank you. Um, I'd like to reintroduce um, Associate Professor Hadrian Jajajikata, who's probably got some interesting news for us. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, John. Uh, just happy as well to meet your other half, Jasmine Jenny. I obviously got Ross here, my president of the II because I'm the first president, so I actually need to be really actually good today or tonight, right? So otherwise you will basically probably talk to me later on. Uh, this is an exciting time for us because this day, today is basically the election day for Indonesians, but for us, the Indonesians actually live overseas. We actually already cut our food right uh, in the last few days. But So let's start by basically say who won. Right. So before I actually, I got only eight slides, so I don't have as many as Phil. So I'm not worried about time. So who actually won? So for those who actually don't know yet, right, we did, uh, to the, uh, this year election, presidential election is between the incumbent president Joko Widodo, right, uh, always known as Jokowi, and the former Major, Gen Major General Prabowo Subianto. So it was a rematch, if you like, from 2014 right election. So the quick count has been. Finish? 
and it's 55.45 from for the incumbent. So this is quick count, right? not the real count yet, but 12 uh, survey if you like, companies consistently show the same, right, really, really close figures, 55 to 45. So we will expect that Indonesia will have the same precedence, different vice presidents, right, in the next five years or for the next five years. So the final uh, announcement will be made by the Electoral Commission uh, in the third week of May. So the real count will, will be started, and the third week of May, the, the, the announcement will be made for, uh, formally in terms of who actually won the, uh, the election. So that's the probably good news for, okay, so for some. This was the quick count, right? So I'm, I apologize that actually I, I, I prepare only eight slides because today I prepared all these slides, but at the same time I actually check my WhatsApp, check my Facebook, check my internet, or basically monitor what's going on in terms of the elections process, in terms of the result, quick count, right? Real count, quick, uh, sorry, uh, exit poll, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the results more or less from the seven, probably six uh, polling polls, so it was very consistent, right? So we will actually see the incumbents win the election. Okay, now, the, today's topic is about this. So the wake up of parliament will be of interest to, uh, significant to Australia as it will determine whether or not the recently signed Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Partnership Agreement, IHCP, will be ratified by Indonesia, and if so, how long it may take to get through. So Phil actually gave already a really, really solid introduction, robust introduction to about what it is. So I will probably give some ideas in terms of what's actually next for Indonesia, right, in terms of this agreement. Okay, so this is, the, the important thing about the election is not just the presidential election. Presidential election is just to select, right, or choose, if you like, the president and the vice presidents. But the decision was not actually, is not actually made by the president only. It must be made by the member of parliament as well, if you like, right? So this, so what I'm actually more interested in is the, is actually the, if you like, the results of this legislative, legislative election, uh, rather than the presidential election, because it is quite consistent in the last five, six months. The polls actually show Jokowi is leading, right, against Prabowo, so it's quite predictable. But the question is, how is actually the, if you like, the, the results of these parties, if you like, elections? So the survey, the, light, the latest, I showed you the latest survey, right? These are the, this is the latest survey from 13th of April, from one of the legitimate, if you like, polling company. And if you look at these parties, I'm not sure whether you're actually familiar with these parties. There are 16 parties, contesting parties, right, in, do, in this year election. So we can see the predicted, if you like, results. So PDIP is the Jokowi's party, if you like, right, actually predicted to be the winner, overall winner. And Gurindra is the Pro Bovo party. It's actually second, predicted to come second. And then the remaining of them is if you like the supporting parties, either to number one, we call it contestant number one, Jokowi, or contestant number two, right, Probovo. So if you look at the result, you can probably, at this, looking at this slide, you can actually predict which one is actually will win. But if we actually now put them into coalition, coalition number one and coalition number two, right? So if you actually look at the, the, the pictures over there, right, for Jokowi and his running mates, and then the picture of Robowo and his running mates, then you can actually see underneath the pictures the parties that supports coalition number one and support coalition number two. And if you look at the results, if you actually have separated the, the predicted, if you like, results, then you can actually see that number one, coalition number one, will likely actually become the majority. Right. This is the survey, the latest survey. Quite consistent as well in the last three or four months in terms of the, what's predicted to be the results. And then if we actually look at the exit polls, right, overseas voters though, right, in the last few days, right? <laughs> Sydney, Melbourne, Toronto, Berlin, Singapore, for example. And you can actually see the one that actually highlighted in blue are coalition number one, Jokowi supporter, right? And then in, in that pink right, is a Jokowi supporter. And it's quite consistent as well. It's actually better than even the, the, the survey. But these are overseas people. Overseas people are likely younger people, millennial if you like, right? students, some of them or most of them, and they tend to basically like progress, like development, and they actually worry about something radical or something that actually not really uh, in their mind rational, if you like. 
So the tendency is to choose coalition number one, right? And they choose parties that actually within that coalition number one. So uh, that's the results from the overseas polls, if you like. And then I actually started to look at the quick count. So this is really fresh, right? So the result is really fresh. This was 5.08 p.m., right, before I actually drove here, right? So I basically screen capture it and then put it in my, on my slides. So then I basically just check, check just now, a minute ago, or a few minutes ago, and feel talking. The results are nearly the same. 40% of the quick count, right, of the data now have been counted, have been gained, have been counted. More or less, this will be the result. So looking at this, I make it simple. The coalition number one will likely become the majority. So if that's the case, it means that the government is actually stronger or will become stronger because up to now, in the last four and a half years, the president come from PDIP, right? But the majority of members of parliament come from the other side, right? Although in the process, this is Indonesia, in the last four and a half years, some of the parties that actually supported Prabowo and then shift gear and then move to support Jokowi, and then there are a few of them. So Indonesia is unique. Things can change quickly. There is no such thing as permanent coalition, right? Coalitions change every in every election, and coalitions can be different across levels of government. So at the national level, these are, you, I just showed you just now, these are the coalition, right? At the provincial level, right, the coalition will be different for governor, if you like, election, governor election. At the regional city level, for example, the coalition can be different as well. So that's actually the complexity of politics in Indonesia. So it means that the decision that's actually made at the central level, if you like, at the top level, doesn't mean that we will be actually delivered at the level underneath that, right? So because every region, every area got autonomy to actually make their own decision. Regulations also actually different, right? Across national regulations, governmental level organization, city level, right? Regional level organization, uh, government. So. In that, with that in mind, let's come back to the SIPA, the SIPA right? Phil already gave the details, showed you the details in terms of what's actually benefits Australia or what would be the benefits, of, to, especially Australia. So almost all, right, 99% of Australian export to Indonesia either tax-free or having or will have preferential, preferential treatment. And then if you look at the FDI, to Indonesia from Australia, right, 750 15 million Australian dollars, right, more or less. And the leading sectors are mining, food crops, uh, plantations, basic metals, metal goods, uh, as well as actually hotels and, and restaurants, so service industry as well. But in, it is expected that, that Australia investor will find it easier to invest in that in those above sectors, but also in sectors, new sectors, if you like, such as financial services, tourism, hospital, infrastructure, and education. So there will be opportunity, for example, for Australian uh, universities to set up, if you like, their branches, if you like, their campuses in Indonesia, for example. That's for example. So where is it, what is it actually in it for Indonesia? So obviously Indonesia needs more FDI, right? So the investment is expected. And Indonesian products whose export have potential to increase at the moment, automotive products, especially electric and hybrid cuts, uh, Phil already mentions, wood, right? Including furniture, textile, et cetera, et cetera. And also, not only that, visa, right? Phil, uh, Ross probably can talk about that. A visa quota internships program, and also uh, improvement on the Indonesian professional standards, if you like, right? So there are other aspects that Indonesia expect to get, right? Not only in terms of the export, but also professional development, if you like, right? For their people. But the question is that there are some doubt about this SIPA in Indonesia. The question is, is really actually a win-win agreement? Right. Although it's mentioned since the beginning, the idea is that we actually want to have this agreement as a win-win agreement. The question is, is it really a win-win agreement? So if we actually look at these differences between the two, right, some Indonesians actually feel that, okay, right, we, haven't actually, we don't actually get enough from this agreement. So there are also questions about what's actually the effect of this abol abolition, if you like, of tariffs. Right, what's actually the effect to the local industry? Right, okay, we need more investment, but is it really actually the agreement that actually cater for the the things that Australia wants? Uh, sorry, Indonesia wants. Okay, so with with it, even with we with the ratification, right? So the, the the agreement has been signed. 
it will go to ratification, right? So the importance of this election, right, is really it is actually really really high because the member of parliament will actually decide whether they agree with the, the, the signed agreement or they will actually ask for changes. It's similar to Australia because it's also, right, we will actually have election here. So it is really critical time, right, to basically see whether the ratification of the agreement would still be more or less the same as those agreements that actually been signed. The details, that especially the details. Even if the ratification is made smoothly, Right, the deal has been will be signed later. There are a lot of still challenges, right? So the first one is that Indonesia still need reform, a lot of reform, reform to reduce protectionism. Right? Phil already mentioned, and it's not a secret. Doing business in Indonesia is not easy. Is it better? Yeah, in some aspect better, but it's still not easy, right? So there are still things that need to be. Change, especially as I mentioned before, even President Jokowi has tried to actually reduce red tapes, corruption, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are different level of government, different regulations, and that's create really complexity in terms of implementing the policy, right, or the national policy. Improvement in productivity, right. So workers, right, companies need to actually improve their game themselves. Corruption is always and still right, an issue. Tackling of corruption, it's reduced, but it's still right, a level at a level that is need to be reduced, reduced, reduced further, obviously. Red tape as well. Across different levels of governments and into, into, into institution. And also the things about readiness to collaborate. So if you basically think that if you got this agreement, then companies can actually just go there and actually collaborate, you basically kidding yourself. Right? You really actually kidding yourself, right? So you need to know right, how to deal with Indonesian people. The same way Indonesian people need to know how to deal with Australian people. Right? So the last one is the mutual cultural business understanding, whether we actually got enough understanding, right, mutual cultural understanding. And if everything is OK, there may be a chance that the agreement will actually create good results for both countries. Thank you. Hadrian, uh, in 10 minutes, <laughs> well class. I mean, uh, I think uh, in terms of the night of the Indonesian election, not only to give us that um, analysis, but to link it to the uh, agreement with Australia, <laughs> just fantastic. So thanks very much. Um, now I'd like to reintroduce Ella to speak uh, and give her perspectives. Thanks very much, Ella. Hello, can you hear me? Good. <laughs> you know, the hardest part is to speak, uh, speak uh, in the third line, in third in the line, because I need to make sure that I don't repeat what previous speakers have uh, mentioned in the talk. So my first attempt will be uh, consist of five slides, but after that, I'd like to share with you uh, my graphs, because today I'm very keen into graphs. <laughs> All right, so without further ado, I just wish to uh, uh, welcome you to this uh, forum where we're going to discuss more about Indonesian election. Um, this is uh, marking the 20th year of Indonesia's uh, democracy uh, following the uh, old regime, uh, sorry, the new regime, uh, Suharto's. Um, Just a flashback to what we had uh, five years ago. This is the result of the legislative election. To me, it's more important to talk about the legislative elections than the presidential election because we, we, know, we know so well who's going to win. Um, but in 2014, the, uh, the red um, implies PDIP. The uh, yellow uh, denotes the Golkar and blue is uh, Democrat. So these three parties uh, and and Garindra, uh, the uh, are the uh, the darker one. So these are the main winners in 2014, and they shape the policies in the last five years. They also the one who uh, came up with the. Uh, electoral uh, laws about how to, to do the elections. 
and decided to have a one or single day election, the most complex ever in the world, such a, you know, uh, such a task for Indonesia. That is also one of my key critics to the election this year, because for those who run for legislative seats, you don't have a space to talk about your programs, you don't have sufficient you know, time to, to discuss about uh, your visions or your missions. We don't know much about you. Because since September until April, six months, this is also one of the longest uh, period for a uh, ca campaign in Indonesia, all the, the, stra you know, the, strategy imply the strategies and the energy being absorbed for legislative election, sorry, for presidential election. I hope you're still with me. So the trouble with that is we don't have enough information about who's going to represent us in the House of Representatives. In 2014, it was legislative election first, and then three months after that, the presidential election. So we have that space to think and to focus on the legislative first. Because my research, uh, which was submitted two weeks ago, uh, was about women in parliament. So many respondents that participated in my research, uh, you know, they, 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 they said that this is not a good, a good method to have elections in Indonesia because we don't have enough, you know, that capacity or, or opportunity to talk about our, you know, uh, candidacy. So it's all about vote for Jokowi or vote for Prabowo. That's all that matters. At the moment, I'm doing this research about how they, uh, you know, uh, express their ideas in social media, these female uh, candidates. And are they talking about themselves or are they more talking about presidential candidates? From my general observation, it's all about the presidential candidates, which is, we, we want to know about you that we don't get. <laughs> I'm also need to tell you how important Java is for Indonesian election. If you win in Java, you win Indonesia. Because 50% of the uh, you know, uh, people who vote in Indonesia live in Java. Uh, this is the presidential election. Red is uh, Jokowi, blue is Prabowo. So in West Sumatra, for example, they have a landslide win in 2014. We don't know yet because the final result or the official result will be uh, announced 35 days from now. So what we had now are just quick counts. This is what I'm saying. Java, most populous. Uh, there are 58% of uh, voters live in this island. So you need to win this in Java, and the rest will be, because the prerequisite to win in Indonesian presidential election is to win 50%. Whoever gets a 50% will win. The trouble with this, I need to tell you, that the representation of women, apparently that almost 75% of elected MPs in 2014 lives in Jakarta. Not Java, but Jakarta. <laughs> so where's the representation? The parliament is far from representing the population. That's the other way around, I say it. Because it's the, the, it, if, you if you look into the list of candidates, where they live, they put the information where they live based on their KTP. So most of them are living in Jakarta or, ba or Bekasi or you know the greater Jakarta, but Jakarta. So if you have such you know um, uh, concentration of Jakarta, Jakartans or Jakartanians controlling the politics in national level of the parliament, we have a serious issue. Why the local candidates can't you know have a good fare in elections? Now we have to talk about the next topic, which is how expensive it is to run for election in Indonesia. Let's talk about logistic. In Java, maybe everything is easier compared if you have to compete in, let's say, Maluku, or let's say in uh, Kapulawan Riau. You have to travel to small islands. You have to pay for everything. 
So it's very, very competitive in terms of financial resources. And we don't talk yet about you know, the fraud and everything. We just talk about the logistics. It is a big issue. Then my research also finds that women, aside from complaining about how expensive to run, but also the perception towards female leadership in politics. Unlike here, I can compare a little bit. Um, in Indonesia, women can still triumph in election if they got the correct connections, you know. Uh, and we are not that, how do you call this, um, showing that, you know, uh, kind of like a harsh approach towards women just because our majority are Muslims. Because that is another blanket statement that I like to counter. Most women, I, I interview uh, female MPs, most of them saying that they receive su success because of the support from Basantrans, because of the support from Pangajian or the Islamic classes, the informal classes. So there are, there are opportunities for, wi for winning women in, in legislative elections. But coming back again to my first critique, that this year, we don't have sufficient you know, opportunity for legislative candidates, which is such a big loss for Indonesian democracy. And number two, when they decided to do the single day elections, one of the main rationale or justification was efficiency. Uh, people will say, rather than having two days of party, let's make it one day. You know, like you're having a wedding day, don't make it two days, just one day, so we can save some money. But you know the result? 61% more expensive than 2014. So where's the efficiency? No, we don't have that efficiency. We didn't achieve that rationale. Why? Most of the uh, expenses goes to monitoring, goes to uh, security or securing or, or making logistics and etc. And also the cost of hiring certain people to work for the uh, electoral stations or polling stations. You can imagine having five big papers, big papers, one day, if it's only like normally they counted, the electoral commission counted the time, people, one person will need around 10 minutes from the registration until they finish with the ink. 10 minutes. So we can't have the same number of TPS or polling stations. We need to add more polling stations from only like 500,000 to 800,000. Yay, right? So we hire more people. So that's the cost. So where's the efficiency? I don't know. <laughs> because for me, as a scientist looking at how important we choose the right legislative candidates, this is a big loss we spend more, 61%, more expensive. Maybe we should rethink about this approach. So we have the energy to vote for our legis uh, legislatives, and we have the sufficient energy as well to vote for our leaders. This is my thought that I'd like to share. Uh, again, quick count. Uh, mine is a bit outdated, but sorry. Uh, he's doing really well with the quick count. So basically, uh, 55, 50, uh, 45, this is uh, two digits, as they predicted already. So it's very, very convincing, 10%. Uh, I did vote on the 13th of April, which is because we're overseas, we do it earlier, but we count, do the counting today. So we do the counting the same day. I was thinking about this uh, this morning. Maybe I'm just being too wild, but what I think is this. Looking at how the 2014 and 2019 we have two polars, the same polars, taking place this year. They're not done with 2014, believe me or not. And then the 2019, the cohesion is, is under threat. The cohesion between Indonesians are under threat because, uh, let, let me give you a clear idea. When somebody, I'm not saying anyone, but if somebody trying to tell you, let's prove that you support me, by wearing a certain dress to the electoral uh, station, and your followers will do so, then those who don't wear the same costume will be easily identified. No, you're not wearing the costume, dude. So you're definitely not supporting my president. You know what I mean? 
So that's what I encountered on the 13th of April. I went there, <laughs> so funny. I went there at 2.30. In Indonesia, you only have six hours to vote, right? From the start until finish at 1 p.m. But here, very generous, they finish at five. So I can come at two. You know, I was like, oh, I just want to be there, not queuing. Get there, 2.30, and there, and I don't wear white. So people who's wearing white know that I'm not wearing white. So they already automatically think that I'm not supporting their president. They don't know that, you know what I mean? They don't know that, and I don't have to tell them. But the perception is already there because of the sign, you know, that you need to wear that kind of specific dress code, if you like. What I'm trying to say here is this. There's something wrong with the single day elections. I strongly believe there is. But also the trouble with uh, presidential threshold. Oh, I need to stop. Okay, let's talk about presidential threshold when I have the question. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Well, thanks so much, Ella. That's uh, terrific observations of... Um, from Really, it, it's... As someone who someone mentioned I was there twenty odd years ago, but it's quite a remark, quite a remarkable physical act to vote and count all those votes in Indonesia. Quite extraordinary, right on our doorstep. So, um, look, I'll give us all a, just ten seconds to digest all that, and um, I'd like to suggest what we do now is we've got time for Q and A. I'll I'll stand up here, and there's a microphone there that. Um, here it is, microphone there that we can all hand around. And Molly has a microphone that she can use if you have a question. And um, here we go. Oh, we're going to do the, how to hold the microphone. No. <laughs> so we do have it. Last last time we had a terrific slide that kept going on how to hold the microphone, which was uh, really good. So I wonder if um, if um, we could lead with uh, the very first question. And the very first question is... There's two up there. Yeah. The lady in the second row from the back. And if you, if you wouldn't mind just uh, as a courtesy introducing yourself and, and asking, asking a nice question. Thank you so much for that very insightful talk. Um, I'm Hayley Winchcombe. I'm a student at UWA. Um, I just wanted to ask Ella, because she kind of led into it, uh, could you tell us about presidential thresholds and why that poses a problem for the election? Okay. That's a good question. <laughs> Should we collect questions first? You can, no, go for it. Yeah. Okay. S sit down. Is that okay? Yep. Go. All right. Uh, thank you for the question. Yes, so the presidential threshold... Uh, for 2019 is 20% of seats in parliament. So parties with 20% of seats or combination of parties in parliament of 20% minimum can nominate presidential candidates or 25% of the national uh, tally that they have in 24, uh, 2014. So this is very high. As you can see from uh, the quick count, parties with over 20% is only like what? PDIP. And the rest... 7, 10, 11, you know. And that is, that is all, this, this is the trouble. If you only have, you know, one party exceeding 20% benchmark and the others need to, qua uh, to, do, to do coalition, then you only have at least two, two, you know, presidential candidates. That makes the polarization deeper. We can't break that polarization, which is terrible. Let me give you an example. If in, uh, Provincial governor, you know, or the uh, municipality, uh, Bupati, for example, can run from independent. They can run independently. So no need for party support. Why are we letting this happening if for the president the stake is so high, 20%, as if the party will dictate who should run the, co uh, the, 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 the country? To me, it's too high. Second of all, this year as well, Parties can only get seats in DPR or DPR if they got 4% at least. Minimum is 4%. That's a threshold. So as someone said to me before, 
with that benchmark or that, that threshold so high, maybe Senator Anning cannot get into in Indonesia, you know? <laughs> Men, 4%, otherwise bye-bye, yeah? And then PSI, for example, this is a you know, very uh, promising uh, new party just recently established for this election. Uh, some people are expressing their disappointment because unfortunately they don't even get the 3%, I think. So they have to wait for the next uh, turn. I hope that explains your question. Thank you. Well, Hadrian or Phil, any would like to add anything on that question? No. Okay. Uh, the gentleman at the back. Thank you. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for your presentation tonight. Thank you. I'm Alexander Broad. I'm at uh, Murdoch University. I just wanted to know from the panel what is your perspective on West Papua. And I just wanted to know if Australia and Indonesia have such a close military strategic alliance with securing security within the region of that particular region in West Papua and also in Australia and Indonesia as a whole. Uh, do you think that Australia and Indonesia can work closer together to resolve the conflict in West Papua? Thank you. Thank you. Who'd like to answer that one first? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll be, I'll, uh, thank you for, for the questions, first of all. I'll be, I'll be honest with you, I actually don't have any clue. Right, that's probably the easiest way to say. Right? As much as I try to, as much as I monitor the progress, it's something that for us, especially uh, me and uh, make, I come from the business area, right? O feel obviously, right? AIBC, right? So, Ally is probably also doing some politics, but that area is something that sometimes probably really difficult for us to digest, right? So there are many layers of layers of unknown things in that in that uh, issue, right? So, I don't want to basically be. Uh, Answering without actually have really actually knowledge enough knowledge on that. I'm not sure about Ella whether she knows more about this issue. Uh, no, I don't have uh, experience in terms of researching West Papua, but I think uh, it is an important uh, issue to be discussed uh, among these two countries, Indonesia and Australia. From an Indonesian perspective, uh, the Indonesians uh, perceive West Papua as part of Indonesia since 19. 60s, uh, but if the Australians, some some you know some Australians consider the other you know the other fact that they believe, that is also things that we need to respect. Uh, but I think what we've seen in the last five years is such a great effort from Jokowi to pers you know to persuade Papuans to fall in love with his regime by doing more projects in in Papua. Uh, nothing's perfect, I do agree, but I think. Uh, Australians also need to understand that for Indonesians, Papua, West Papua is part of Indonesia, and it's hard to say not, not the case, I think. Bill. Uh, if I can just add, certainly not an uh, expert on international politics, but you'd all recall that um, you know, Australia's in involvement at East Timor was a very controversial um, occasion. And when you look at the, tr the relationship between Australia and Indonesia, often the challenges are reduced down to lack of trust, lack of understanding. And certainly Indonesia has historically had a lack of trust of Australia meddling in, in Papua. Um, so, so many are still suspicious that Australia might want to get involved in there and that would be problematic, I would uh, imagine, if, if we did. I, I don't sense that Australia's got any ambition to get involved in that um, Situation, but it's a, it's been a very controversial one for some some time. Can I just, just with that? Well, I just want to add a bit what Ella just mentioned. It, it's an it's a sensitive issue, obviously. But as Ella mentions, it's a matter of really actually probably historical distrust, if you like, right, and disappointment. But pres but President Jokowi has tried actually to channel the if you like his policy, for example, infrastructure. He's actually big in infrastructure. But this is the first president in, of Indonesia that actually really focused on the development of infrastructure in the east region of Indonesia, so including Papua. And he also tried to actually make Papua as, if you like, as similar as possible in, to the other region, especially with Java. I give you an example. Fuel, for example, one liter of fuel is about $12 Australian in the past. It's different than when you actually purchase fuel in Jakarta and Bandung or other big cities, it's only about a dollar per liter. Now in Papua, it's the same price, a dollar per liter. So that kind of policy is actually uh, made by Jokowi to basically say, hey, you're part of us, right? So you're actually not really our street, our actually, uh, I don't know, right? So 
an area that is actually uncared of, right? It's actually really an area that actually we also care for. So that's that's the policy. I think it actually have work. Obviously, disappointment still there, right? Obviously, there are people that still actually underground, right? Guerrilla, you know, if you like, still actually try to uh, express their disappointment. But improvement has been made, in my view. Thanks. And there's a question back, the lady at the back, right at the back. Thank you. Uh, my name's Jessica, and I'm also from Murdoch University. Just to follow up with that, you said that um, President Jokowi has benefited West Papua through infrastructure. However, there's been recent suspected use of the white phosphorus chemical weapon attacks in the Nduga region of West Papua. Um, how is it possible <coughs> that international media is still banned in the West Papuan region of Indonesia? Why has Australia not implemented a direct approach to hold Indonesian authorities accountable? Is it reasonable to remain silent about the humanitarian crisis and rather talk about the economic interest between Indonesia and Australia? Thank you. I, ca I can probably start and probably others can add. Well, there is one aspect of, if you like, Jokowi's policy that in, in, some, uh, in the view of some people is actually still disappointed. That's actually true, right? So if you actually look, focus on the ideas of human rights, for example, there are a few cases that people expect to be solved in this government, and they have not been solved. Right? That's actually something that people or some people has actually tried to emphasize. So if you actually look at uh, those disappointments and link it to the election, for example, there is a move right, to not vote. We call it in Indonesia, Golongan Puti Golput, for example. Right? So if you actually go to Twitter, you can actually find that, if you like, movement. Don't vote, because there are things that your COVID has not been resolved. So that's actually clear, it actually do exist, but in terms of the specific questions that you actually ask, right, I don't have any really actually clear answers for that, right? It's actually beyond me, right? So in terms of the details, but that aspect is actually, uh, if you like, uh, felt by some people, obviously, right? Thanks, I want to, just, just here, if I can have a quick, unless Joel, you want to say something? No, no, yeah. no. Yeah. Got a question, second row, thanks. Yeah, this question is for Ella. Uh, just starting on the dress code that you mentioned earlier, and you worry that it's possible that it could create division among the voters. But could it be from the other side, uh, the voter strategy during the campaign as well, to make it not very obvious between you know the pro two one two, the gerakan two dua satu dua, so. They were white, and supporters of Jokowi also were white, and supporters of um, Prabowo also were not, you know, often come up with a white, uh, you know, safari. So, so the other side possibly also has. Yes, thank you for the question, Bu. Uh, so this is my personal experience. I, I'm not going to generalize it, but this is how I uh, observe the election by myself. Uh, the trouble is when the uh, uh, the president, sorry, the incumbent uh, asks his supporters to wear certain dress code. That's a trouble because I don't think that we need that you know division anymore. This is our party. This is our festival of democracy. Don't wear anything because we have luber. That's the principle of our election. If you don't know this, the Indonesian word is luber. Uh, langsung, umum, bebas, dan rahasia. So the R here stands for, it's a secret. That's what we forgot. That this is not about, you know, they don't know who I vote for. They don't need to know. Because if we continue this, this will just create the polarization deeper and deeper. And I think we, we need to learn from everything that happened today and 13th of April. Because in the end of the day, we're having you know, a festival of democracy where we cherish our democracy and we don't need to know whether you're in the same camp with me or not. That's, that's how I see it. But probably Prabowo and Jokowi has a different view of this. With regards to two one, uh, 212 movement, they were white, yes. 
uh, the latest big show that they had on 7th of April was also about get the whole you know stadium white, right? They did that, but the the white you know wearing white I mean not the white wearing white dress to the polling <coughs> station I think that is not a wise you know uh, request from candidates to do that upon their people I think that's my personal opinion because I don't want them to know who I vote for. This is Luber. <laughs> I wonder, uh, we've got time for two or three questions. I see Amy, and then Ross, and then Jenny, and that, um, and a couple up there as well. Let's see how we go. We've got till eight o'clock. Thanks, yeah. Ron. Can't even use our own microphone. Is that on? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so my question, um, I think it was in Phil's slide where you mentioned, um, Phil, about one of the uh, positive impacts of the IAC for Australia is having more... Uh, students and also labour workers coming to Australia. Um, and I wanted to ask, um, you know, what WA could do to entice more of those Indonesian people to come here to our <coughs> state, uh, particularly um, in light of the need to diversify our, our economy here away from um, resources. Um, so just wondering, yeah, what we can do here in WA to position ourselves and leverage, um, you know, being in the zone and how to get more of those people here. Thanks very much for the question, Amy. Well, certainly international education is so important in any case. You know, when you look at the, the relationship, you know, having shared experiences, Indonesian students studying here, Australian students studying um, in Indonesia. And, and again, I know Haley, uh, at NCP grad, you know, the New Colombo Plan's a fantastic program, the Australia Awards. There's so many institutionalised programs which are, are doing a great job. We just like to see a lot more. Uh, in terms of WA, I know there's been a, an international um, education policy released recently by the state government. Jennifer's probably better equipped than I to talk about it. But I guess frustratingly for West Australians, you know, we're whipped by our East Coast counterparts. You know, m many more uh, Indonesian students want to go and study in, in Melbourne and Sydney. And a lot of it's historic, you know, the, it's generational. You know, you get the grandparents, they send their... Yeah, it keeps going. And, and I think just generally we've seen West Australian tourism. I, I think generally WA hasn't sold itself particularly well uh, with respect to the government, uh, the budgets for promoting West Australia as a destination. You know, you look at the, the wonderful advantages Western Australia has got, um, we're just not very good at telling that story, but I hope that we're, we're getting better um, and possibly later Jennifer might be able to share some, some more thoughts on that. Thanks, Phil. Well, just a bit of speed dating here. I wonder if I could go to Ross quickly. Um, Sorry, uh, my name is uh, Ross. Uh, just uh, a very quick observation and then, and then a question um, um, just on the back of an envelope results that we're getting in on, on this quick count. Um, probably on a more sober note, um, as I say, doing it very roughly with my colleague here, uh, this little one, um, We've, we've still looked like we've got about 45 million Muslims in Indonesia who did not vote for Jokowi. So I think in the quiet of the day, once he gets settled down, uh, it'll be very interesting for him and his colleagues to do some work there about who are they, what socioeconomic group do they come from, uh, are they the youth vote? Uh, so there's a lot of questions there, I think, to be answered. But having said that, I think, uh, as Hadrian's already pointed out, <coughs> not only has he, uh, it looks like he's increased his vote personally, marginally, um, but just an early look at those numbers, certainly in the Parliament or the, at the DPR, it looks like it's a huge increase. So I think in terms of the relationship for Australia, what it looks like we're heading to, although it's early, is um, um, uh, a, a very strong president in a very strong position with the power in the Parliament to get things done. So I think, as Phil's already indicated, I think that just screams to us in Australia um, given the fact that, without being too unkind, we've pretty well trashed our relationship with Indonesia in the last 10 years. Um, so there is really a, uh, a huge opportunity now, as you mentioned, Phil, through IACPA to... Um, and this may have to come through a change of government here. We'll, we'll leave that to the Australian voters. But, but to really look at Indonesia now uh, as being a very stable democracy in our region with a strong leadership and a strong parliament to, uh, to say how do we really um, now make a, a reality of those almost cliched words that we've used over and over again about 
really doing something in this relationship. So, sorry, with that rambling on, John, the question I suppose I, I say to Phil is that the one thing that worries me, and uh, Phil and I have been involved with AACP for years and years and years, um, but what, what concerns me, of course, is that if you look at the Lowy Institute research, it, it still shows that 44% of Australians, including our future business leaders, don't trust Indonesia, treat them with suspicion on the level with Russians. Um, and I just really wonder, I suppose the question is to my colleague Phil, is, is that an issue that, with the help of the AIBC, we, we really actually need to address for that? Because I, I just really find it hard to rationalise my, my business brain like you've got in terms of the huge opportunities that await us um, with a background of the fact that, based on what Lowy says, 44% of our future business leaders don't even like them. So I just wonder if you can comment on that, Phil. Sure. Well, of course, Ross, that same poll would tell you that many Australians don't even know that Bali's part of Indonesia. So um, there's a lot of education to be done, and I guess it comes back to that word socialisation. You know, there's a big job for us to get out there and, and you know, um, tell people uh, what the real the truth is about some of those things. You know, again, the same poll uh, would not rate Indonesia as democracy, but, you know, you look what happens today, what a great exhibition of democracy I in action. So, um, but but like yourself, uh, Ross, we're ridiculous optimists. So when people talk to me about these challenges, I always get a stupid smile on my face and say, well, look, that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. You know, if, if it wasn't for some of those gaps in where the relation could and should be, uh, perceptions, you know, that gives us something to get out there and, and talk about. So I know, Ross, uh, you're very high profile in the media and I know you're out there always uh, yelling loud about Indonesia and, and, and trying to educate people and we'll be doing the same. So, But every, everybody in the room, I hope all of you will go away tonight knowing a little bit more about Indonesia from a whole range of perspectives um, and be able to correct people in the street, you know, your own friends who might come up with some of these crazy notions about what Indonesia really is. So it's up to all of us in the room really to make our own contribution to that uh, conversation. Thanks, Phil. I wonder if I could, just in the interest of um, three quick questions, Jenny. Thanks very much. That's great and to be here. And, uh, the visit coincided very, uh, very well. Just to pick up on the points around education, you know, for us in the WA office in Jakarta, education and training is absolutely a top uh, priority. We're, we're very conscious of the need to really promote and position Perth as a city because I think that's where we're getting some real competition from Sydney and Melbourne. So we're looking at doing a joint campaign with Study Perth to really try and, I think, correct some of the outdated perceptions of Perth that are out there in Indonesia. So there's a, a lot of work that's being um, done there. I just want to endorse uh, your points, Phil, about ICEPA and the benefits. If you look at WA's um, trade and export profile in Indonesia, with export, you know, um, it's our 10th largest export market. It's a significant market for us. Um, big profile around agriculture, um, mining, education, training. I think there's some terrific opportunities coming out of ICPA, particularly for uh, Western Australia. So we'll be looking at really exploiting those and using ICPA to get a bit more awareness of the opportunities that are presented by Indonesia, it's a bit um, <coughs> under the radar at the moment, so we're looking at the head turning at mm. impact of uh, ISEPA. So a couple of quick comments, and, then and I, I think th I, I'll have you to hand over. I did have a question, but I think Ross. Yeah, in the interest of so. two really quick questions, uh, just here on the just here on the <coughs> left, and then Jim, and that's and that's um, that's all we've got time for. That's running it hot. <laughs> Thanks, I'm Robert Ryan, I'm a member of the this is the most exciting event I've ever been to. Why? Look at that. I mean, this is just a course. We have 229 women. Here's a class of people in this city. And uh, forget about the youth. This is where the next is going to really get quite right. Look, to get back to the city. What's going to happen to Sharia law in Indonesia? Is it going to be expanded or not? Is it only one question or Please. one question? Okay, uh, go for a panel. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, thank you for the question. Uh, just to clarify that Sharia is law. So if you say Sharia law, it's a, it's a repetitive. So Sharia is law in, in Arabic. Yes. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yes, I agree. I also learned from you. Uh, so I, from my perspective, I don't think it's very likely to expand uh, only in Aceh because uh, we know that they have the status as the Nangro Aceh Darussalam. From the name itself, it's very uh, Islamic. Uh, so they put Sharia uh, in, in that provincial, uh, provincial uh, government. Uh, again and again, in every occasion that I've got the opportunity to talk, I always try to emphasize one message, which is Australians, don't worry, your neighbor is not going to be radicals, okay? I'm trying to convince you again and again, please. Some people, you know, come into that conclusion because they don't know much. This is the opportunity for us to know each other better. In Islamic teaching, we know that there's a phrase in Al-Quran saying that God created you different race, your different color, not to hate each other, but to know each other, not to tolerate each other, because toleration is the lowest part of getting along. But to know each other is very on top of it. Like, I know your child's name. I know where you go to school. You know, know each other. I know how you pray. I know how you, you know. So the level of knowing it's very important because without that sufficient knowledge about your neighbor, all is all about fear. And I very have a very strong critique to ABC and SBS as well. I watched their video two days or three days ago. There's one respondent, you know, using a very hurtful sentiment. He said, he said Indonesian, he said that this is the rise of Islamist fascism. I was like, what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then the other person, uh, he's a media person, he said to, to, to the camera, saying something, you know, why we have this, you know, uh, Islam, uh, oh, sorry, political Islam is on the rise, because, I discussed this with my peers as well, this person said something explicitly like this, if you go to one particular, you know, place of worship during Sunday, you will find people going there with their beautiful cars, you know, expensive cars. But if you go on Friday, it, they don't name the, the religion, of course. If you go on Friday, they will bring their motorcycles. So he said, he concludes that, you know, there's a jealousy, unspoken jealousy in terms of economic performance. And I was like, what? <laughs> Again, I was like, how, how can you come up with that conclusion? Can you imagine? If people going to mosque Friday, bringing their cars, they can. I tell you they can. Imagine where do they park, you know? Because we're talking about lots of people attending in the same spot. And again, if people go to work on Friday, they just go and do the, the solar in Friday, the same place as they go to do their, their real work. So they don't bring their cars, you know? So that kind of imaginary of Islam, political Islam in Indonesia is damaging. I mean, you don't know that, you know, how can you come up with a conclusion? You know, I tell you what, in Indonesia, for you to be able to go to do Umrah or Hajj, you have to pay at least 20,000 Australian dollars. And the queue, the shortest one is for, for uh, certain provinces in Indonesia, is 10 years. So they can pay for that. You know, by saying how, how heartful is that for, for me listening to that, you know, Monday, oh sorry, so Sunday they go with cars, beautiful cars, it's Friday, you know, poor people go, you know, worship their God. It's like, don't say that, you know, we don't need that. And this is for Australian public. For me, like, there's another reasoning why we will find more terrorists, because they're envy, you know, because they have this economic dissatisfaction. It's like, what? You know, don't listen to that. Listen to Indonesians next to you and talk to us so you know better about Indonesia. I'm so disappointed with ABC and SBS, I have to tell you. Can I, well, can thanks, I, just, so can I just add? Yeah. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> That's really good answer. Yeah. Sure, go can, for can it. I I just I can you just add a bit? Right or no, Sorry. Please, please go, but otherwise it's fascinating. Let's oh, go. Can I just add just a bit what Ella mentions? I think the other thing is that, in my opinion, is actually we all, including me, actually got a disease, which is called exaggerations, <laughs> right? So we like to exaggerate, really, right? So to create drama, unnecessary drama. So if we basically look at something, we jump into conclusion, right? Oversimplify it at the same time, overanalyze. And that's actually create problems, right? So as Ella mentions, without looking at actually the whole pictures, just looking at one aspect of someone or something, then we jump into conclusion. 
the prejudice and essentially create come from the exaggerations and if you like the creations of unnecessary drama just just a, a bit of addition okay look i'm going to have to go to jim and that's it i'm afraid so um, i want to the next president to be female all uh, right. Now, we, we, we have had one female president. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Jim Baxter, I am. Um, quick question, but I noticed in all of your talks, nobody really mentioned the religion aspect. And I wonder, at this early stage of analyzing the results, is it true to make a conclusion that religion had less of a, an influence this time than we, sh we would have expected, based on the parliamentary outcome and so on. Is that, is that a valid conclusion? Hannah. Okay, so one of my research, because I did my thesis as a series of publications, so one of my, paper, one of my papers discuss about uh, how, for, for this is very specific, about uh, parties nominating female candidates, right? So the research shows that uh, either Islamists nor pluralist parties, they promote women at the same uh, a portion or percentage, 30%, 30, 35, but uh, that's good because the, uh, the minimum for quota is 30% for parties to be able to run in that uh, electoral district. But both camps did also terribly uh, miserable in terms of promoting women as candidate number one. So we know that we have 30% of uh, candidates need to be women, but where are they being promoted? Because 70% of those elected uh, MPs need to be number one. So forget it. If you, if, you, if you don't have that top spot, it's so unlikely for you to get elected. That having said, I'm trying to say is that uh, religion, yes, playing a role in election, no matter which election, uh, 1999, 2004, and so forth. But the polarization makes it worse. The polarization when we have only one or two, you know, one or two, and that's it. And people are saying, well, either you with me or you with them, which is too, you know, too simplistic. But that's the polarization that we see. And both camps playing the religion card, both, both camps. When Prabowo being asked, what do you think about radicalization or Islamist uh, radicalization in Indonesia? And he replied that question by asking, who choose the running mate, a cleric? Oh, okay, you got that. Okay, yeah, right. So both camps use the religion card, like it or not, because they know it's 85% of voters are Muslim, so you need to, as we published in the conversation today, or was it a couple of days ago, that you need, to, uh, either Prabowo or Jokowi needs to be religious enough for voters. Okay. But, but then again, coming back to how the voters are evaluating these candidates. You know, not only just religion. It will be interesting if one day we have a Christian, you know, put, you know, presidential candidate, or and the other one is Muslim. Then we will have, you know, a more polarized, uh, disenfranch uh, disenfranchised, if that's the word. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thanks, Ellen. Look, thanks everyone. I think we better draw it to a close. I'm sorry to cut across what will be a f would be a fascinating discussion, but you're welcome to stay for dinner, <laughs> and um, we'll have a, um, a session outside. But uh, thank you, everyone.